Friends, our next guest really needs no introduction. He was the lead singer for the band Guardian. He sang on five albums for the band Adrian Gale. He has released one solo record, and he has a new project uh, called uh, Calamity Kills. It's just released their first record. Please welcome with me Jamie Rowe. Hello, hello. Jamie! But truth is, I've actually done two solo records. Oh. I did. In 2004, I released the Songs for Heaven and Earth, Dios de, uh, oh. de Amor, the Spanish thing, and then This is Home in 2019. Oh, I stand I refuse to go forward with this interview. <laughs> Where's well, my fetch you. my shawl? I'm departing. <laughs> well, thank you for correcting me on that, Jamie. Um, okay, your second solo record, Jamie. The, uh, this is home was released in 2019, and it had more of a somewhat country feel oh, to yeah. it. Your mm -hmm. new record, Calamity Kills, is definitely an all-out rock record. When did you start thinking about maybe doing the Calamity Kills record after no. this is home? That's a great question and stuff like that because it's funny, you know, I to give you a little history, and we kind of covered this before, but you know, around 2014, 2015, um, you know, for for my work at True Tone, which is a guitar pedal effects company and stuff, we we were doing an ad with a Florida Georgia line and um uh, with their two guitar players and stuff. We shot that and they I, I got some tickets to go see them. And I went to the show and I was like, this is like the, the best Bon Jovi show I've seen in like a long time. You know what I mean? And so I noticed there was a lot of stuff about that type of music that resonated with me. Like, you know, my, you know, 80s pop so classic song structure. It just seemed like, you know, like melodic hard rock with an accent. That's what it sounded like. So I got, got into that and went through a phase where it just like, you know, it was just, it was really, you know, it took me a while to get past the vocal aspect, but the music was you know pretty much 80s rock to an extent that formula the sound i kind of you know would gravitate towards it. and i still kind of write with that song structure i use modern production elements but i still kind of write that basic style structure anyway it really resonated with me and then i met my wife amber and we listened to like you know the highway on xm all the time and stuff and just got to where i, was, I like you know artists like lee bryce and just kind of went through a phase that i really like this and uh and i just started writing songs i had totally given up on music you know i was just really content with life and would write songs mostly for Amber, just, you know, because I'm one of those guys that has a song and I just have to write it, whether anybody's going to hear it or not. And so, and then our Rex, our mutual friend, Rob Harris, who I'd met, had in, you know, said, hey, he goes, I know you told me before that you'd love to play the Bluebird sometime. He goes, I've got a writer's round. Would you like to be a part of it? And so I did. And I went and played that and played these songs that I, I only played Never Say Goodbye that night from Guardian. All the other stuff was the stuff that ended up on being in this is home record to complete strangers nobody knew who anything was and they really liked it especially the people at the bluebird like the staff who hears everything it was really encouraging i remember telling amber on the way home i wonder if i should do a kickstarter and see if people would want to hear this recording and having that mindset which i still even had with kills to an extent let me put this out there so we can hurry up and fail so i can move on with my life that's literally and amber you'll test right you hear that that's the truth isn't it yeah and so I always kind of go into the thing and I'm always like legitimately surprised that people still care. But anyway, let me condense this so you don't have to edit a bunch. But so anyway, I made that record. I absolutely loved it. It was a blast. It was something new. And, you know, I decided once again, just to write what I write. Now I'm going to sit down and write this record that is going to sound like this thing. I just wrote songs. Then the pandemic hit and this is a defining moment. I've talked about this before, but this is a really defining moment. I'm going to name names. This was during the time when people, you know, the first few months, actually it's funny, the last show at the Bluebird before they shut it down for the pandemic was in the second time I played the Bluebird. Like we played on a Friday and the next Monday it was shut down for like months, everything. So during that time, I'm working from home. People don't know what this is. You know, everybody's like trying to buy toilet paper. Just the world is crazy. People are losing their jobs. I'm hearing about people dying and it's just chaos. And I remember listening to the highway on XM and there's this guy, Nico Moon, who was an artist had this song we're gonna have a good time then i'll be sipping on some real all the cliche christian language. and it really it really turned me off and it was a defining moment i can literally pinpoint it i turned it off then it's like man I've got, no no thanks and i started rediscovering rock again and i've been away from rock for so long that rock became like fresh to me again you know going back to cheap trick and things like that i love but then stuff that i'd missed that was popular for 20 years like romstein who I'd never, you know, paid attention to other than like Du Haas and stuff like that. I, I, Amber and I were watching something and it auto played a Ramstein scene, how you pronounce it, live show. And I was kind of like, wow, this is awesome. So I really got into it and stuff. And then I realized 
when I was writing, I realized I'm starting to write riff based stuff again and everything. And I actually wrote a song that didn't make the kills record. It got replaced by the song Anthem at the last minute, but I wrote a song called fool's gold about things that look of value that ultimately have no value. And I wrote it. The second verse was like, uh, like it's, well, it's like uh, one day I turned on television, the channel was CMT. Uh, they were playing a new sound in Nashville. It sounded pretty good to me. It was, uh, what was that? It was, it was, it was Tom. Pe it's, 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 it's like it was something. It was heavy metal with an accent. Tom Petty with a cowboy hat. It took Nico Moon singing "Good Time" to say I've had enough of that. <laughs> and that did not make the record, but <laughs> it was, it was, it was pretty cool. It's like the chorus is "Fool's Gold," uh, "Rusted from the Weather," "Fool's Gold" doesn't last forever anyway. But but I pulled at the last minute for the song "Anthem" on the Kills record. So, so but that's it. So anyway, so I fell back in love with rock. And the thing is, I love metalcore. Like, I love to listen to it. I'm not a metalcore performer at all. It would be stupid if I tried, you know what I mean? Because it, it, it'd be playing a role. But the production element, I can bring that into my music. And I think I've got a nice little hybrid and stuff. Just, you know, traditional hard rock songwriting with that production element. I think we've, that's kills, you know? Take a shot at me if it makes you feel better I believe in the truth now more than ever Bitter little wannabe attention getter I don't bow to your pressure You said you were doing a Kickstarter campaign so you could hurry up and fail, but mm -hmm. actually the second one did even better I know. Than, than This Is Home. Like it, it funded 121% of your goal. Insane. Um, and, and I know you've said this several times, Jamie, you know, you, you really hate to ask people for money for anything. I, I know you personally do not like that, but um, I'm sure that you, you were happy that Calamity Kills even did better than This Is Home. That, that had to make you feel good that people want to hear from you still right it, it was pretty pretty mind-blowing like i said and, and like i said i don't want to come off of this like false modesty thing but guys for real i never expect these things to go through i just think i've kind of worn out my welcome and i'm always like legitimately surprised and it's probably a negative thing that i, I kind of approach a lot of things like that like you know that's the mentality hurry up let it fail so i can move on because you know i you know they're going to figure out that i shouldn't be playing music and they're going to send me on my way but it's was pretty mind blowing. The only thing in hindsight I wish I would have done is I didn't really factor a few things in. One, we spent about twice the budget that that we earned on Kickstarter. We spent about an extra. We pretty much matched that outside of the record. Whoops. And then the other thing is international shipping. I didn't realize this. You know, I opened it up for CDs. I didn't realize I charge like ten dollars shipping. The minimum I've had for any shipping has been like thirty dollars. <laughs> so I've actually gone into red on that too. So, so please, guys. Put, be your nine-year-old girl and stream one of my songs like overnight, like a few times this week. <laughs> Help me make that back. So, but no, but it's it's been really cool. But I'm always genuinely surprised that people are still interested. I really am. Especially when I, you know, I'm not giving them what I did 30 years ago. And knowing that that's what they signed up for in the first place. This is something new. Knowing that, I'm even more surprised, you know. Kent, you had a question? I do, Jamie. I just... I just want to say, if I may, and I mean, I'm just, you know, just a fan, but uh, I just want to say that I applaud you. Uh, you know, I have, this is home, but mm -hmm. I, I, what I see in you is the artist in you uh, because you can make an album and do it well, like this is home. And, but then, you know, it, the joke is so you can hurry up and fail with calamity kills, but it's just a mark of a true artist that you had to do that. I mean, you're compelled to do that by the artist in you. And I just want to mm -hmm. say that my hat's all, I tip my hat to you for being the artist who you are. I, I thank you. That actually means a lot to me and stuff. That's why I'm like, I, I don't, I mean, there's so much noise out there. I just don't want to just be another thing that adds to the noise. You know what I mean? But I literally have tried to put down music and stop all the time. And I just come to the conclusion, I can't. I cannot. So I'm going to do this until I can't, you know what I mean? Like I've got a song, you know, I've, you know, Jamie and I are going to be hitting the studio fairly soon. I've already got new songs ready to go. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just how I've written. And it's just, it's something I, to be honest, my life would be a lot better if I could shut it off, but I can't, 
You know what I mean? It'd be a lot less stressful and everything like that. And, you know, and that's, that's, you know, when I'm in songwriting mode, that's time I could be spending with my beloved Amber, you know what I mean? So anyway, but I'm still just, I hear something in my head and I can't relax until it's finished. I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can't hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your I'm That's... gonna tag along with what Kent said, Jamie, and I think this this is why these Kickstarter campaigns um, do meet their goals in that because people know you and they know you're an artist. They know they're you know they're gonna get the real deal. I guess is what I'm saying too. Like from you, they know it's coming from your heart, and well, that you're you're giving 110. You know, well, a few things I tried to do too, just for, you know, especially for Kickstarter people, because especially when they you know I you know I felt really bad because like you know, like I said I I put oh February we'll we'll be able to release in February and realized that's not realistic at all when you know basically you're you're not a full active band with four members rehearsing and stuff like that and people's schedules. But if we had made that deadline, Ray from Corn wouldn't have been on the record. I probably would have had Kia and, you know, eight, I, 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 I talked to Ace Von Johnson, so he was going to be on there, but you know, even Tony Palacio scheduling, some of that stuff wouldn't have happened and it worked and stuff. And I made sure instead of like I said, I probably could have shaved the shipping, but if people were going to get a CD, I wanted it to be an event. So that's why I did the 24 page booklet and made it like something like when you got it, it's something like, okay, wow. You know, it's not just, it's not just a cover sleeve. You know what I mean? And something like you can hold on to and everything. Yeah, exactly. So uh, open that up a little bit. You know, all those like things, you know, there's all there's there's a photograph kind of with every lyric and everything. Yes. Every song got its own page. And I wanted to do that because like, you know, I wanted it to be an event. And, you know, and there were people I wanted, also wanted to reward the people who said yes a year ago. And then, you know, it's like, look, OK, you waited for this. Let's make it worth your wait. So. Yeah, I love that. That 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 frame right there, if you see the heart and stuff, you can see Ghost in Event. That's a kind of a tribute to the Queen's News of the World record cover mm -hmm. and everything with the robot on that. I like that, but I just kind of like that just the the visual and you know, and there's no real deep meaning to a lot of this stuff. It's just a striking visual, and uh, anyway, it was really fun. So hopefully, people I... and the people like unless they're lying to my comments stuff, I like get people really seem to connected with the whole project artwork and everything and stuff. And so that, that that's rewarding for me, you know, I think for me, what I've really appreciated Jamie is that you have everything you just said, as far as those of us who contributed mm -hmm. and it took longer than you thought. And you said, well, gee, it took longer. Everyone's going to get this because it took longer than what it should have been. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, yeah, the booklet, I mean, I'm looking at all the artwork and everything in the booklet, and I'm just like, this is crazy. I mean, an independent, this is crazy. This, this, this is so good. I'm passionate uh, about it. It, 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 what I appreciated too is look, the CDs won't be here for another month. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets downloads. Even if you didn't buy and pay for downloads, you get it. it it's like there is a reciprocity here where we're support, we've supported you. You in turn have said, look, I've done my best. There were things outside of my control. The mm -hmm. least I could do would be this. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 you, you talked about all the production value and everything here. It is a massive, it's a massive release. It, it really, you. really is. I'm, I mean, I, I, this year has been quite the year in Christian rock Mm -hmm. in metal and whatnot and you know anybody who's watching that hasn't heard this and they're going to sit back and say well does it sound like guardian mm -hmm. it only sounds like guardian because jamie is singing on it this is not a new guardian record yeah this yeah. This, this thing is its own and it, the songs the songs are catchy they're memorable they hit and they're honest and authentic. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's really important to me.
man i tell you what it, it's still like it was really you know it, i if you're a backer you understand i try to do my best to update people all along the way but you don't know how it feels to like when you're laying in bed and you realize okay i just ordered the cds from the manufacturer it's still going to be three weeks gosh uh, these people have waited so long what do i do you know what i mean that kind of stuff, almost to the point where it's like, I don't know, I really, and I'm saying this, don't hold me to it. I really don't know if I'll ever do another crowdfund. I, you know, I just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's too much of a, st a stress. Like I get. I'd almost rather do singles and then see and then now, now if, if, if I get picked up by a major label again, and they want to do something in the album format, maybe so, but we'll see. But Jamie, let we'll me see. say something real quick. Ken, I yeah. want to get to you, but let me just say something about this whole Kickstarter thing. And I've done a bazillion of them. Mm -hmm. Whenever someone says, hey, the project is going to be done at this date, I know probably for a fact because of circumstances and things that are out of control, that's hardly ever been delivered by the date that they say. And like with you and these other artists, that I know or have supported before, I mm. know it's going to come. I know it's going to be worth the wait. So like, please don't, don't not do one because of that, because I it think was... most people understand like me that being an independent artist and all of that, there's just so many variables that you can go with the best laid plans, but like, mm -hmm. you know, it just doesn't work that way, you know, we know in the real world and stuff. So well, I, I hope you do do another one, but like I knew it was going to be worth the wait and boy, was it ever. I mean, it's incredible. This is to be fair. Thank you for that. But to, to be fair, I only really had one person, one person sent me a note said, I will likely think again before I support one of your projects. And that was midway through because when I didn't want to email blast it, it went late and I thought, okay, that's fair enough. But something I have done, and this has aggravated a lot of people, and it's not my case, you know, I've not made the CD available to the public beyond Kickstarter backers. And part of that is because I was very adamant up front, this is where you're going to get a CD. This is not going to be a bulk round. This is where you're going to get it. And the thing is, I'm not punishing people who didn't get it. I'm rewarding the people who did. And so I want them to have a space like, look, this is it. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. It's, it's cool. And I, and I made, I, it's a small font, but I got every person's name on that credit that made it happen. You know what I mean? But that was really important to me too. But um, you know, it's like I said, it's like, I don't, I don't feel really good about, you know, like I said, Hey, it's going to be done in February. And here we are. September. It basically was almost a year to the, to the day almost. Wow. And that's, that's just hard. I'm, I'm glad it, I, I do think it's worth it. But the thing is, with our economy and stuff like that, I'm sitting there thinking in my mind, you know, somebody probably pitched 60 bucks because they wanted a t-shirt and they wanted a thing like that. You know, it probably made them uncomfortable. They probably skipped a few like lunches that week. You know what I mean? And, and I literally think about this. I know I probably overthink it, but that stuff bugs me, man. Sure. You know? Well, I tell you, the, the longest Kickstarter I had to ever had to wait for was five years. Dude, I've got you beat. And you're probably, did you, did you, well, there's the, I guess I can say it because it's, it's public now. Dude, I, I, I backed the Fleming and John record like in like seven or eight years ago and it's not showed up and I don't think it's ever going to get done, you know, so, <laughs> but yes, you can yes, cut if yeah. you need. <laughs>
it's a mm -hmm. reward for those who said, Hey, you know, here we go. Let's, let's do this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I get it. And I don't feel punished at all. My question is though, for someone like me, who's a little behind the times and kind of old school mm -hmm. and who does, who would like to purchase your CD when it's available for the rest, when might that be? I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to say, hopefully we're recording this. This is in early November. I'm hoping to be fair, by the end of the month in December, we'll have some CDs available for people in a, in a very limited run, you know, just to, to get it out there. But I'm also, there's two, there's two reasons, like I said, you know, if I, I mean, I can't say too much, but if something happened and a, a label that would be surprising to everyone came in and picked up this record, then I'm stuck with a whole bunch of CDs and can't do anything with them, you know, so to independent manufacturer, but, uh, you know, and so, you know, I've had some, some people, you know, reach out and offer like, Hey, you know, do, would you be willing to license with this second? And it's once again, I'm saying, I'm saying no to the good to, to, to make room for the great. It's a gamble. It may, it may fail. It may something like that, but, um, there will, there will be some CDs and especially, you know, like there, there are enough people who have been making noise about it. I still want to do CDs, vinyl and cassette. I've got a single that I want to do for the, the 280 songs as a retro piece, like make like maybe 50 of them in the little sleeve, just the 280 songs on a cassette single. There are <laughs> things I want to do, but I can I can pretty say pretty confidently by December, first of December, people will be able to order a CD if they want. It may be a very limited run, but so by the be. time you see this, friends, because if I'm not mistaken, this is going to be dropping this episode December the 9th. So, friends, by the time you receive you, you see this. Make sure you go out and snag one. Clint. You either go out and get it, or you know I just lied to all of you, and you hate me even more. So, <laughs> yeah. well, Jamie, let's talk about the who is involved with the project. Yeah, um, Jamie Parano yeah. produced and engineered the record, um, and the production is very modern sounding, which yeah. is, but it's it's great. And nothing against that. You're good friends with him, right? How do you he's, know? He's him? my he's my best friend period okay. and stuff like that yeah absolutely it's funny he actually um 2007 or 2008 i forget guardian had a show in argentina and tony was out i forget who he was working for where the, but he couldn't make it and everything and carl had met jamie parano at church through a mutual friend stuff and he was playing in a worship team like filling in and stuff like that and they hit it off and he goes you know my friend jamie here he can do it and stuff so i literally met jamie and 48 hours later played the biggest show in the history of guardian. We played for 85,000 people in Argentina after I'd met him for two days, you know what I mean? But wow. we just, he and I just hit it off. We have a great working relationship. Like I said, we're friends. We, you know, we go through, we, we go through life stuff that has nothing to do with music. You know what I mean? And, uh, and everything. And he's um, just a really good friend, and, you know, and his resume and he's, he's, he's real modest, but you know, he was Leanne Rhymes guitar player for like five or six years he was also Taylor Swift's musical director for the first two years of her career to the point where even like he taught like a lot of her how to play guitar everything. But so he's got that background. He's worked with, you know, um, Stevie Nicks before Joy Belladonna from Anthrax, believe it or not. So he's got his own pedigree and he's a monster guitar player. Um, but he's actually, you know, it's funny. He's at his core. He, he works a lot in country, but he's a rock guy. You know, like when he's like 15 or something, he won some sort of thing in Dallas where he got to meet like Eddie Van Halen and got a Kramer guitar just from stuff. So he's 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 really good. And when I would play him songs and stuff like production style, that's kind of out of his comfort zone. That's like, this is what I hear for this. Dude, he, he's a sponge. He absorbs it and dude, he makes it happen. You know what I mean? So it's like, we have this great chemistry. And even though Kills is my record, it wouldn't sound like it does without Jamie. That's just a fact. jr mcneely missed yeah. most of the songs and that guy is top notch too anything he does it, you know he's one of the best jr has been my friend for gosh 30 years you know what i mean and i was actually glad because you know he doesn't he doesn't mix as much i think he does educational stuff like i think he works for a college and stuff like a teaching or something like that but when he said he would he, i said hey man we do it because be honest we had another guy mix that was fairly known and i got it back and it's like uh no, you know, uncle, help. 
<laughs> everything. And so, but I knew Jr. Jr. kind of you know knows our stuff, and he's mixed some records like the Amberlin record back in the day that I really loved. Never take friendship personal, and I knew he could do it. And sure enough, man, he he started off. He mixed two songs, and it was like, do you want to keep going? Want to keep going? <laughs> yeah, he ended up mixing the whole record. So, and he did a phenomenal job. But his his resume speaks for itself, and he's just he's my bro, dude. You know, it's like. I've always I've always called him VR for some reason. Said like you know old people when they get people's names wrong. I was like VR. So I was calling VR. So well, and you were talking. Um, you know, you have some special guests on the record. Could yeah. you kind of go through the list and tell yeah. us who you had and and that sort of thing on the record, Jamie? <clears throat> the biggest well known I think people you know obviously like are kind of impressed with is Ray Luzier from Corn. You know, he also played with KXM and everything. But here's what's funny. Uh, at my gig at True Tone last year, actually, when we were doing the Kickstarter campaign, when it launched, I had just made an ad for Corn for, for True Tone, for Guitar World magazine. It's on the back cover and stuff. They, you know, everything. And I was working with management a little bit. And so I kind of got to know those people a little bit, not in the band and stuff, but it was cool that the band had to sign off on it. So I was like giddy because like, okay, cool. They like, they like, they like the ad I put together. Great. And uh, then a few months later, I was sitting in with Parano. We were, because everything, the whole record started off with program drums. We had program drums on everything. That was the skeleton where we laid everything down. And the program drums actually sounded great. But it's like, there's just nothing like a live drummer. And I remember saying, man, it would be really cool if we get somebody like Ray Luzier to play. And I'm telling this to Parano, and, and he's he's working. He's like, I said, man, I'm going to email management. And so I emailed the manager and said, hey, you know, you know, I know you know me from True Tone, but I'm also an independent artist, stuff like that be interested in having ray possibly does ray do sessions and before i could even get a response jamie finally turns around and he goes you know i i used to kind of know ray luzier back in dallas when he was in the nixons and and i i said really he goes yeah he goes i wonder if i could get a hold of he he goes he would definitely remember because he was used to tease me because i look like kenny g because parano kind of looks like kenny g and sure enough, we had another mutual friend. I said, you know who I bet has his contact? I bet this guy, Smith Curry, is a mutual friend of ours who played, you know, when Nuno came to town, he's playing with Smith Curry and stuff. He plays in Kid Rock's band. And sure enough, Smith, yeah, man, here's his number. Parano texts him and Ray's like, dude, of course I remember you. What's up? And so we had to wait for like two months, but we finally got it down. And, you know, he was going to, once again, he was going to do two tracks, two tracks. He ended up doing four and he was fully into it, like fully into it which is great and then scott bush who was also the guitar player in the nixons in the 90s with ray he engineered this stuff and and he's just like his personal engineer so there was just a really good group of people there to deal with but the whole fact that ray one would do it in the first place was amazing and two the fact that he cared and was like fully into it was just like personally rewarding for me you know it wasn't just a, a you know a paycheck and a project for him so right. hey, actually you know i just got a text from those guys like like I got a text from Ray two days ago and I just got a text from Scott like an hour ago. Hmm. So we've made some good relationships there. Well, and you, you had Tony do some yeah. guitar work on Dearest Enemy. Yep. He played the guitar solo on that. And you can, you, you can tell, man, it's like, it's, that's Tony Palacios doing his thing, which is, is still great. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, bu to be honest, I hate to say it, but it's kind of a bummer that, you know, you don't hear Tony playing music anymore. You know what I mean? So, cause it's, it's, it's clearly he hasn't lost anything and he totally nailed that solo. It was quick too, man. So, well, when your your wife does some background vocals or vocals on two tracks, also we can't forget about she her. did. She she was the one that said pressure on the pressure. Mm -hmm. I don't bow to your pressure. I had her say that <laughs> <laughs> like that, but yeah, I was I, Madeline, my daughter, yes, is the voice on I still believe, and that's yes. that's an iPhone voice memo I had her sent. I said, honey, oh. just say I still believe like three or four times and send it to me, and that's it. You know what I mean? So, and she didn't get paid. <laughs> Yeah, she, she gets she gets the fa I get the family discount there. Okay, okay. <laughs> You also, speaking of I Still Believe, yeah. um, it just got added to Octane on Sirius, on Sirius XM. XM. Yeah. I'm sure that's, you know, really wonderful news for you to see that as an independent artist. If anybody out there understands how radio works on paper, that should never have happened. It never have happened. 
we, you know, we, we got a radio, we do have a radio promoter working a single to rock radio. It's actually, it's, it's, it's funny. It's in the, there's certain phases like where you send it to radio through their database and you, you contacted them, they get a chance to preview it. They get a chance to download it. Then they get a chance to consider adding it. Some people will play it like once on the air, like, Oh, what are you, here's a new thing and wait for feedback. Some people will add it within 20 minutes of the guy at Octane Vinny up in New York, hearing the track from the conversation within 20 minutes, he said, this is going into rotation immediately. And mm -hmm. that's unheard of. I do think having the Halloween season probably helped a little bit because there was a, they really connected with the Lost Boys film. I think that probably had some influence there, but I was just hoping to get on their show Test Drive where they give something like play it once a day for five days and see if people will respond. And we bypassed that. And the thing is, guys, this is why, this is why it's like, I feel good about taking these risks because that doesn't happen and and the thing is if we took that slot that means another major label who was pushing one of their artists didn't get that slot and that's unheard of and so i was like and, and, to, and to be fair if i was going to radio i wouldn't i wouldn't lead with that track i really wouldn't but it's working so yeah. here we are so i'll be surprised i'll be sur surprised you know it, like i said right now as of today we're the number two most downloaded song by radio programmers in hard rock right now, in the nation, awesome. in the nation. Awesome. Now, what they decide to do with that is out of my hands. You know what I mean? But they went far, they streamed it. Okay, we like this. And they went to download it. Usually when you download it, it means you intend to play it. So we'll see. So there are, there are people who live in that radio world that it's all beyond me that, that hopefully they're doing their job and they'll just give me nice reports. Well, looky here, somebody just showed up. Come on over here. <laughs> Who could it be now? There here we go. she comes, Miss Amber. Amber. Hello, Miss Amber. Hi, you can't hear Amber. you. Yet. Hey, Miss Amber. Hi. Thank you for Are joining you? us. Yeah, I look awful. I'm so sorry. You look no, awful. No, you look wonderful. Hey, give me I a little. I didn't have picture. time to make. I didn't have time to do my hair. So, <laughs> Jamie, I have a question at this juncture. Um, yes. Sir. We were talking about I still believe, and of course yep. I remember I was a big Call fan back in the day, and yeah. I know we're a lot alike. We both like the spectrum of music. So my question is, what was the catalyst then for you choosing as one of your songs I still believe, and also uh, Pure Energy? What's on your mind by Information Society? Okay, so here's the thing. Whenever I I decided I definitely wanted to do one cover song on the record, and the first thing I chose was um, uh, Where the Streets Have No Name by U2. That was originally going to be it. And I'd work up this kind of like cool arrangement, like a, a electro, electro rock. And it sounded really cool. But I realized a lot of people have done that song. And then one of those things that popped up on my random playlist was the call, uh, uh, Let the Day Begin. Here's to you, mother love, the blessings from above. And it led me on to this, to I Still Believe. And I thought, that's the song I need to do. Because I knew Rust Half had done it and, you know, everything. And I loved some of the stuff he'd done with it too, you know, replacing the saxophone with a vocal hook. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could really do something. I, and basically I heard it in my head and thought, I'm going to do this. So I went on the Kickstarter during the campaign and played a little acoustic thing and said, this is the cover I'm going to do. So it was basically based on that. And then there's a, there's a podcast show on YouTube called Professor of Rock. Are you familiar with this at all? Yep. I really like that guy's stuff, yeah. the Professor Rock. And he did a breakdown in one episode one day of Pure Energy. And I thought, wow, that's just a really cool song. I forgot how good that was. And in my head, I heard the whole dissonant, da, na, 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 na. Pure Energy. I heard it that way and thought that'd be really cool. And then I'm thinking, well, I can't do that. I've already announced the cover song. And then I realized, wait a minute, I don't have to answer to anybody. We can put two <laughs> on here. You know what I mean? So that's where that came about. That just came out just because I, I love the song and stuff. There's no meaning. It's to me, it's 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 such a great, well-written song that to to be able to retranslate it as, as a hard rock thing and to get Kia to sing the female part on it from Concrete Divide was just, I, th I, I think it was just like one of those magical moments. And I, and I hope that that song gets a shot to be heard too, because I think it, I think it turned out fantastic. So Jamie, with the single of I Still Believe, uh -huh. Will we get to see you do a video for that song in the same vein as Tim Capello, who did it with Lost Boy shirtless and with that saxophone? On? Not, not without an NC-17 rating. <laughs> no, Un unfortunately, I'm built for comfort and not for speed, and I can't pull that off. So, um, 
but that's that's just the fact. But actually, to be honest, I was just telling Amber this. I'm going to start working on the video stuff where I still believe. I had originally been working on, you know, I was going to, I, I have this great thing lined up for Dark Secrets on the record, but this kind of coming in kind of has kind of thrown things off track a little bit. So I'm going to make some 30 second video clips and stuff. If you guys know my background, you know, I, I also dabble in like video stuff like Unreal Engine and 3D stuff. I got some cool stuff I've not been able to release that I'm looking forward to. So, and my assistant director here is going to make it happen. <laughs> Well, and I want, I'm glad Amber's here because I want to talk about this artwork. Um, yeah. yeah. Amber, That's not her. That's well, not her, but that. chemistry is based on her. Okay. Well, I just wanted to, as a whole, this booklet, we've talked about this before, but this booklet is just incredible. All the artwork is, I, I just want to know, how did you guys do this or who, who came up with all these ideas? Um, you know, here's, here's what you're talking about, Jamie. Yes. See, I love um, that shot. Yeah, I mean, it's it's gorgeous, uh, you know. I mean, that had to take time to do all that, right? It does take time, and you know, it, yeah. as you know, stuff like it. She and I, you know, I do photography, or I, I said I should say I did photography. I haven't really done it in the last year, but you know, I would shoot a lot of people. And that's like a song like Hellfire Honey, mm -hmm. comes from like shooting local models and stuff, and hearing like there's there, you know, some of those girls are just you know basic models. Some of them did lingerie shoots. Some of them had those OnlyFans sites. And we'd get in conversation, you realize, like from the OnlyFans girls, they would comment how many, quote unquote, religious married men they have as subscribers. And so that was the basis for writing that song. But anyway, so to, to get back on track, what you asked about the artwork, visuals are very important to us. And if you guys see, you know, you know, I, in the kills photos, I look like, you know, Mad Max, the end of the world, the apocalyptic thing. I This is another thing I wanted to do, man, at this point, I've always wanted to do a theatrical, over the top, you know, almost like, you know, kiss inspired, you know, just something a little bit different. And this is my chance to do it. So yeah. I want to make the visuals very strong. Yeah. See, Kevin's got that photo up there <laughs> and, stuff like, and you know, and that right there, that's, that, 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 we shot that like right over here yeah. in my kitchen, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I look all mean and stuff like that, but it's just, you know, it's just a little bit of eye makeup and some kind of contacts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, and that, that, that kills jacket and stuff. I'll, you know, that's an old beat up anthrax shirt I bought off Amazon. That's and then that funny. kills jacket is something I bought at like the gap in like <laughs> 1998 that still, you know, I, I was repurposed it anyway, but no, to, so the visual, so Amber and I are very complimentary towards each other. She has a great eye for detail that I miss. And uh, I'm pretty good with Photoshop between that. And then, you know, the mid journey stuff that comes out with the AI stuff where I can basically create a base level of things. And the good news is I can usually start there, but since I'm so, you know, fluent in Photoshop, I can kind of come up with anything I want. So hmm. that's it. Yes, Ken, you have a question. Well, this would be a good time really quick. <clears throat> One of the things I'm glad you're here, Amber, because I like to ask both of y'all. We've been blessed recently uh, with Greg Manier. Uh, he'll oh, yeah. be yeah. releasing. Uh, we're we shot him right team. over here, too. Yeah. So, <laughs> Well, that's the, the, the thing. The main picture of him and Jamie out there, you see like, like a fence and like some lights and stuff. That's in our driveway. Our driveway. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and then he's on his motorcycle, but. Yeah, he mentioned we talked about you guys a little bit with Row Creative. Yeah, yeah, and so that's what I would like to ask both of you, Miss Amber and Jamie, if you can, while we have you both here, could you tell the viewers when they see this? Let's talk about Row Creative for just a second. Tell them what you all do together, and and because it's something that somebody might have a need for their uh, situation, yeah, their music or whatever. Yeah, yeah so uh, we started getting into some photography, uh, Jamie obviously before me, but I came into it as, you know, doing a uh, boudoir type of photo shoots and uh, loved it. It's a lot of work. And, you know, Jamie, we both started out doing uh, the model scene and hey, actually, but, but yeah. back up. Yeah. One thing I was saying, there was got to a point where there were some things I didn't feel comfortable shooting Yeah, that a, a woman and should shoot for her husband. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I got, so I kind of backed out and realized she had a gift for that. So yeah. 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 And so that's when uh, we started doing that and doing boudoir. I haven't done any lately, but we really like to get back into it because it's, it's just something that I love to do. I love to be creative and, you know, um, 
and Jamie's is helps me a lot too with a lot of the um lighting and stuff like that and helps me get set up and then I just go for it and mm -hmm. yeah and so, so Ms. Amber wanna... and Jamie do you all have a website where people if they would have a need for their for a photo shoot for whatever reason is there a website where they can connect with you all no, we both have in individual, we have a row yeah. creative and a, an, an Amber row creative Instagram, but because our lives have been so busy this last year, we haven't had time to do it. So uh, like Greg, Greg came to me, you know I mean? I didn't, I, I don't, we don't, we don't advertise to anybody. They, it's usually people that come to us and we haven't had time to do it, but maybe in the future we can, but mm -hmm. we were able to use those skills and stuff like that on the kills record, yeah. which is fantastic. But no, and Greg's shoot was a blast. He came over, we did some shoots here, just him individually. And then when he did stuff for the record, you know, we, we went out in, sh in his neighborhood and shot the motorcycle and then shot stuff in his studio room. And, you know, and some of those photos on the inside of the thing are, are Amber's photos too, you know, not just mine. So, um, but it's, we love Greg, man. He's just a good dude. And I think his record sounds phenomenal. So, yeah. Definitely. Well, and one more thing about this booklet, Jamie, this yep. booklet is so thick. I know, dude. I cannot get it back into my CD case. Yeah. So imagine, talk about imagine, being, take, what? imagine taking out almost 300 of those and signing them yeah. and getting them back in. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so like it was well worth the wait, Jamie. This yeah. is a 10. I'm telling you, this Appreciate is awesome. It. Appreciate that, I, brother. Um. And I understand if I understand correctly, you might have some intentions of doing some sort of touring with the project. Am I yeah. correct about that or not? No, I'm I'm absolutely going to do some shows and stuff like that. Now, touring is a thing. Like I said, guys, I have a great job at True Tone, and to be honest, that's I mean, my life is really good because of that and everything. Else, you know, and, and that's something I don't want to jeopardize. And in the new climate, it doesn't really make sense for me to get in a van and go play for a hundred people. It really doesn't. Right. But what I'm hoping to do is to do some larger festivals like radio sponsored festivals or some metal festivals where I can get in front of a, a decent amount of people in one shots. And then, then if I can pull some favors and this, this is pie in the sky thinking, but if I could do like 10 dates with like corn or somebody like that, that's going to put it in front of a lot of people at once, that would be smart touring smart. And it would, it would, it would not wreck my daily routine of life, which I kind of need. I have a mortgage. I have all sorts of, we have bills. I can't, I can't go be a full-time musician. That, that That's like, you know, it's like, if you want to make a small fortune in music, take a large fortune and invest in music. You know, I can't do that. So. And, and but the yes, record... I really want to play. Awesome. And that I will be, that would be awesome. And, and Perino's all in too on it. Is he? Okay, yeah. cool. So cool. Well, and the record closes out with the song Amen. And Amen. I think that's just like a good, mm -hmm. softer, I mean, it just, I think that's a good way to end the album. I mm -hmm. and that I really enjoy that song, Jamie. That That's a good song to end on. I thought I thought it was great. To me, I even if you look at the Kickstarter description before I even launched the record, I said I wanted to end the record with that song. It was kind of sums up where I'm at, where things are going. I thought it's after, after, you know, 10 songs of, you know, noise and, and adrenaline bring it down to the quiet moment. And it's just, to me, it's just a prayer of thanks. Mm -hmm. But what's funny is on my phone, I've got the music bed that I wrote to that. And I was playing on my phone and I'm literally at three in the morning, trying not to wake her up. I've got a recording of me whisper singing the vocals. I am thankful for these days. I've got a version on my phone and she's sleeping next to me. And I'm trying not to wake her up. But that night I thought, okay, this is too good. I don't want to forget this. And that's when it ended up on the record. So, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I re-sang it, but that song is a one take vocal. <laughs> Oh, is it? Yeah. I awesome. thought I could hear Amber in the background snoring. <laughs> you know, with the original oh, vocals.
So where can everyone connect with you on social media for Calamity Kills, Jamie? Well, Attend, you know, uh, probably more so right now, probably of all the places, the, the Calamity Kills Kickstarter, our Facebook page. That's where I've been trying to grow things. So I get, they, there's not many people. There's like only like 1,300 people there. And it's really, you know, it's it's getting, it's starting to get a little action. Uh, YouTube is starting to pick up and Instagram is starting to pick up. But between those three, I've got a, I've got a Twitter. I, you know, it's, it's it's pretty much dead in the water at this point unless things take off. But um, I'd say the, the Calamity Kills Facebook page is probably the best place to get to if you want to interact, you got a question. If you want me to see a comment, that's probably the best place to go. Okay. But okay. it'd be awful cool if people showed up and started flooding because it's like I said, it hurts the ego to have nobody there, but I know they'll come. The right people are there. The right people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, and kind of we're gonna we're kind of closing out here, Jamie. Um, what would you like to say to all of your friends and fans or what words of wisdom would you like to share with with um, our viewers? Um, anything on your mind that you would like to say? You may look pretty and everything, but she's she beats me and hurts me and she makes me do things I don't want to do. And no, I can really use that. <laughs> oh my! If you don't know my sense of humor, you just I fully lost you there. <laughs> so, no. Oh, but no, man. You know, here's what I'll say: is guys. Um, Probably with your audience and, and you know, knowing that they all mostly know me from Guardian and stuff like that. Here's the thing, man, I am beyond thankful for my time in Guardian. Absolutely. Like the stuff we did, God used it big time. I still to this day get you know messages from people. I know that God used it. But at the same time, the culture and a lot of things have changed. When Guardian Miracle Mile came out, you know, we, we were on, you know, we did get distribution through Epic and we had a little mainstream side going on. But that was basically when the mainstream was like, no, no, no. Just like Guardian was, was one of the first rock bands that played a lot of churches that opened the doors for bands like Skillet and stuff to come in and play churches later. Well, a band like Skillet and Thousand Foot Crutch and stuff have, and Red have come along and they've done the same thing in the mainstream where now there's not such a resistance to Christian music because one... It's in, in, I think this is a John Cooper phrase, and I really like this stuff. Like he goes, he goes, we decided to be more covert than overt. And I think the communication style really lends itself. And I think the last time we talked about this, I have this great analogy and stuff. You know, it, you know it's, if we're salt and light, you know, if, if I, if I had a, a hamburger patty, sorry, if I had a hamburger patty on my hand and I sprinkle some salt, if that hamburger patty is just like flavorless and dull, all of a sudden it's got a little something extra. It's, it's a lot more powerful. But if I take a, a jar of salt and just dump it on there and it covers it, no one's going to want to eat that. And that's what I think Christian music does, you know, from the past and trying to do the new thing is they dump the whole container of salt. Nobody wants to be there. There's no subtlety. There's a reason why Jesus taught in parables. When you, when you tell somebody information and deliver it in a story, your brain retains it more. So I would encourage people let me get back to the point with the point. I was totally got ADHD. That's where I'm at. And I'm very careful when I tell people, I'm not expecting everybody to be like this, but I want the freedom to know that I'm very passionate about this. And this is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing. It may be the biggest mistake I've ever made, but it feels what I'm supposed to do. If I've ever had a calling, this is be a calling is just to, just to, to, to do something so well. And then when they ask the question, because I speak with a Christian accent and everything I do, that they recognize the accident and know who I belong to. That's the goal. That's all I got to say. And so I would encourage you, if you're going to be, if you're, if it's 2023 and you're, you're a young guy starting a band, don't go, don't go hide your gift in a community because you can make 500 bucks instead of a hundred bucks because in the long term, you cap, you've, you've hit the glass ceiling. You know what I mean? So I hope I, hopefully I made a point there. Did I make a point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jamie, we close out all of our episodes with something we call message from home. And um, it's a scripture verse um, mm -hmm. 
that we do. And you have a song on the record called Sinner's Welcome. Yeah. And I think possibly it was roughly the first song. I know it was the first song that was. Let anyone here mm-hmm. um, that was written for the record. And the lyrics of the song remind me uh, of the scripture. And the sh- scripture is Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Um, and it says, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, mm-hmm. but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the yeah. sinners. Yep. And I think, um, you know, a lot of times we as the church in general, mm-hmm. we, we've kind of lost sight, I think, a little bit of what our what our calling is or what we're supposed to be doing mm-hmm. um, with the mission of the church. And I think your song really addresses that um so that just kind of what i thought would be as a good scripture for that song and the record i can i can truly appreciate that it's it's funny i remember in in december of 2021 uh i was actually looking for somebody to clean the sensor on my camera for our photography thing and i, I came across and the guy that was recommending was in nashville and i went to his facebook page and he had this sign up that said sinners welcome I just thought it was the coolest thing. And, so, and it got me thinking, I found some other scriptures and stuff. I thought that's a great title because that really kind of says all that. That's Jesus, man. Sinners mm-hmm. welcome. You know, and it's funny. I I did have a couple of people on the mainstream side push back, you know, what a condescending thing to say, you know, what makes you think, you know, sinners are anywhere. So I say, man, you're looking at, you're looking at, you're looking at someone who's a really good sinner, man. I'm, I'm pretty dang good at it. I can sin woman. So, but no, but anyway, so, but the thing is we all are, man, we're all lost without, without Christ. And that's just the fact and stuff. And the whole thing is like, you got the, that there's that line, you know, smack talking church folk causing a stink, losing their mind. Cause you chose me, you know, somebody, somebody who God has chosen may not fit into the, you know, the, the costume slash expectation, blah, blah, blah of the modern church folk, but God's crazy about it, man. I still have not met one person that God doesn't love, man. I haven't. You know what I mean? And the thing is, and with my faith, and that's kind of how I see it and stuff, where I'm at right now, stuff like that, my faith in Christ helps me look at somebody instead of look at them and say, gosh, they're just, you know, they're wasting their life. They're a sinner. It's like, that's somebody who's important to God. They don't know it yet. I'm sorry. That, that's heavy for me, man. Yeah. You know, Jamie, yeah. those, the fishermen back in the day, you can't tell me they weren't a rough and tumble lot, uh-huh. you know? I mean, you know, the sons of thunder, you know, they probably threw some yeah. words around, you know, and that's who yes. he was eventually called, you know. So I Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. And mm-hmm. in parentheses, you can put my name after that as number two after Paul. Yeah. So you know, I'm I, thankful the Lord chose me. And I love I love I love when people acknowledge that. You know what I mean? I love that. So Well, Jamie, uh, before time just totally gets away, and, and maybe Miss Amber can can stay too, real quick, because I'd like to issue you a challenge, brother. The Let's last time you were on here, uh-huh. you laid the smack down on some of our friends, and you took no prisoners. Got... Calamity kills, and you took no prisoners. I think, and it, it was I think got lucky. So here's the deal: I yeah. didn't get a chance to participate. So okay. I'd like to issue you a challenge, brother, a friendly challenge, and if I win. I need to see the Tempest box set released. The <laughs> Tempest I'm relegated to cassettes and I love Tempest. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, right. would, would you be up for a, a friendly game of uh, rock and roll? I'm up for it. I don't, I don't know if I can deliver your, your prize that you want, but I think, uh, <laughs> I think I'm up for the, I'm up for the challenge no matter what. Okay. So let me lay the ground rules here. So Kevin's going to be our MC. He's going to ask the questions, the rock and rock and roll trivia. And, uh-huh. Instead of anybody blurting out an answer, and Amber, you can, Miss Amber, you can help Rex. He's going to be the judge. Whoever <laughs> raises their hand first gets to answer. And if, you know, so best two out of three on the rounds here. Okay. I got to hold my ear earbud in here. So my hand is always up. So this will be my hand. Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I, right. I was, I was asked to have 
three sections here. There is okay. a classic rock section. Okay. There is an 80s metal section and then a Christian metal section. All righty. So I have, uh, well, I got eight, 10, uh, I have between eight and 10 questions for each section. Okay. Okay. So what, how do you want to start this? So I'm going to put my hand right here like Jamie has. Okay. So it's fair. Yes. Okay. And we just do this. We both look like we have two things. <laughs> So, so Miss yes. Amber and Rex are going to be the judges, okay? And then whoever they see their hand, they they call the name, and we get to answer. And so, best two out of three is the winner. So let's... <laughs> all right, classic rock. Here's question okay. number one. Okay. What bass player did Cliff Williams replace on ACDC's Power Age album? Okay, good, good. You know, I'm 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 not the ACDC guy. I'm not gonna know this at all. I'm not gonna know this at all. <laughs> okay. No. Can you repeat the question? I I'm not I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, 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 you know what's, because sound funny. because I I was I was told that you guys had already blown through all the real obvious ones. I I'm know like, I I know nothing about ACDC and I know nothing about Led Zeppelin. Uh -huh. Those are those are two bands that people love. That I just okay cool. All right, yeah. so the answer was Mark Evans. No, that that was what I was gonna say. That's it. Yeah, okay. You know, I didn't know that at all. I was gonna say that. Okay, here here's one. This is a softball of softballs. Okay. Okay. Name the breakthrough ballad sung by Kiss drummer Peter Chris. Beth, Beth, Peter Chris. Oh, you can't. You Co have to raise your Oh, sorry. Oh, game. sorry. I forgot anything. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So it was Co Beth by Peter Chris. We'll give that one to Jamie, though, because okay. I'm going to. I can go as far as. So we'll give him a. Okay. Co written, right. by, co written by Stan Pendridge, who was in Chelsea with Peter Chris, also uh, brought together by Bob Ezrin. And. Um, not originally released as a single was the b-side of detroit rock city and the station mm -hmm. flipped it over because detroit rock city wasn't getting aired and all of a sudden it became their hit it also caused peter chris to de develop a large ego and <laughs> and so leading to him leaving the band because he thought that the that, that people blah, him blah, blah. Jamie, <laughs> Jamie forgot the most important <laughs> aspect of that it was originally called beck beck yes <laughs> and yeah and they come up with this bs story saying it's about jeff beck or something like that that they didn't do that but it was actually it was actually neil bogart's uh, first wife who he was running around on and they 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 wrote that as a slam whoa we're, yes. we're gonna give that one to jamie i'm not okay. testing <laughs> so, all right here we go hands up jamie here we go okay all right uh so i stay in the classic rock area okay. here yeah okay what band did Richie Blackmore form after leaving Deep Cats. Purple? Oh, sorry. I didn't even Rainbow. Cat, cat, yep. <laughs> Is that right? Rainbow. Yeah. All right, so it's one to one. Yes. Come on, tip us box it. Sorry, I gotta I gotta put my hand up first. I can't want to blur it up. <laughs> All right. Which album by Irish rock band Thin Lizzy told us the boys are back in town? Yeah, jailbreak. 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 Yeah. There, there was a guy named Darren Wharton that played with Thin Lizzy for a while, and I played a festival in Madrid, Spain, with Adrian Gale. And after the show, he came up to me. He goes, "Mate, what a fantastic voice and everything I got." I always just thought it was cool that a member of Thin Thin Lizzy yes. gave me some props. So absolutely, yeah. there we go. cool. Name the I'm live gonna album. I'm going to have a hard time raising my hand. I'm just going to. He's just going to blur it. I won't. Okay. Name the live album in 1978, which sold over 100,000 copies on import from Japan, which featured such hit singles as Ain't That a Shame and Surrender. Cheap yeah. Trick Live at Budokan. No. Yep. Cheap Trick Live at Budokan? Yes. <laughs> My first concert was the Dream Police Tour in 1980. Nice. I was 10 years old. Oh, wow. 
Okay. Uh, all right. Here, here. This one. Okay. Here's here's one. Name the 1974 concept album spread over two vinyl LPs by English prog prog rockers. Yes. Yes. Tales from Topographic Oceans? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Was I right? Yes. They came out after Fragile. Fragile, it's Italian. Oceans. It is long, slow, and ponderous. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, Jamie's going to think we rigged this. No, I just... That's, I don't know anything about progs. If you go down that road, like, I'm, I'm assuming I'm, I'm assuming this band Dream Theater makes music. I wouldn't know. I just heard their name, so I wouldn't know anything about their music. Which Scorpions album featured the debut of guitar player Yuli Jean Roth? Jamie, is that the one with uh, Rocky like a hurricane? What's that? What's that called? Where go? I can't remember the name of the record. No, I'm just Wait. gonna guess Love Drive. No. Light the Rainbow. Oh. 1974. Yuli Jean Roth, not Matthias Jobs. Yeah. Uli was their first guitarist, was he not? Along with Michael Schenker? Uh, actually, Uli came on board after Sch Michael Schenker was on Lonesome Crow with Rudy. Okay. And then Michael left and went and did the UFO thing. And then Uli came in and then they, re you know, in 74, they released Fly to the Rainbow. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. The, I have one more. I don't know. I, 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 I'm kind of like, I, I think I should move on to the 80s metal section. Okay. okay. Here we go. Come on, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. This band told us to turn up the radio. Oh, okay. Jamie. Oh. That one, Jamie. Yes. I didn't hear. Autograph. He got it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Question number two. What metal band did and does Rod Smallwood manage? Jamie. Iron Maiden. Sanctuary Management. Number three, what was the title on the Guns N' Roses EP that was independently released <laughs> prior to Appetite for Destruction? Live Like a Suicide. <laughs> Uzi Suicide Records. I remember seeing that in a record store in LA in 87. They wanted a hundred bucks for it. I actually had knew it was coming out. I, a friend of mine was going to the, the local mall and I gave him money to go get it for me. And he came back and he goes, dude, you look like a punk record. I said, no, I, I wanted it. He, he decided I didn't want that. I was like, no, go get that. And I I actually had that. So, yes. <laughs> so this, no, this was an original. Yeah, this was too. Uh, yeah. yeah. This was like, I'm, I'm saying I bought it in like 86 or 87, whatever. That's yeah. what I'm saying. You know, I still have it. So. <laughs> it's funny you mention that though, because they want that much for Tempest CDs. That's well, why I need my box set. Here at least they admit Come this in. Okay. Uh, question four. Who played bass guitar on Dawkins' debut album, Breaking the Chains? Jamie. Juan Crucier. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. Question five. What two tracks on Whitesnake's 1987 album were actually re-records from earlier yeah. in their catalog? Good. That was Here I Go Again off Saints and Sinners. And, like a hobo, uh, I was born to walk alone. Yeah, like a hobo, yeah. Yes. And then, um, oh, shoot, hold on a second. Uh, it came out on the next album. It was... Uh, Is This Love? Fool, Fool for Your Loving. Oh, oh I get it. It wasn't Fool for Your Loving? Fool for Your Loving was not on the 1987 album. Fool for Your Eleven was on Slip of the Tongue, which was the next one they redid. Oh, okay. Well, you can but on White Snake '87, there are two re-records. Here I go Brian again. In the rain. Thank you. Yep. So, do I get the point or not? Yeah, I do. Jamie, no, no. Jamie's feeling. Give him the point. Re right. Re <laughs> Rex is the judge. <laughs> oh my! Yeah, I'll give it to Kent. Yeah. All right, because I think I'm behind now. Jamie's smoking me on the '80s. 
I know that's that's why I started paying attention. That early '70s stuff, you you'll you'll bury me with that. In the '70s, <laughs> in '70s, there was Kiss, Van Halen, and Cheap Trick, and that's it <laughs> in my world. Yeah. So. All right. What band did Ron Keel front before starting his namesake Jamie. band? Steeler. Give it to Jamie. Steeler with Ingvar Mumsen and Rick Fox. <laughs> Have y'all seen the new Beatles video, by the way? I saw it the other day, yeah. It's amazing. Anyway, sorry. That's all right. My daughter said she was excited that a Beatles track released in her in her lifetime. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Number seven. True or false? Did John Bon Jovi design the Slippery When Wet album cover by taking a garbage bag, writing Slippery When Wet on it, Jamie. and sent the photo to the late record company? True or false? True story. Yep. But it was after the fact that the original was censored because of the, the busty girl. Yes. That came out in Japan anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right, number eight. Name the band Jakey e. Lee formed after leaving Ozzy. Oh, Red Dragon Badlands. Cartel? Badlands. Badlands. Yes, Badlands. it was. Greg Chasen, Eric Singer, and... Uh, Ray, what's it in? Ray mm. Gillen. Yes. That's right. Mm. All right. This one, I've tried to make sure I got this 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 question. This is what Ruby was the Fox. name? Of, <laughs> what, <laughs> what was the name of the All Star Group formed by Ronnie James Dio to help fight poverty? Jamie. Stars. Hearing aid. I was well, the stars are the name of the song, but hearing it was the name of the band. We'll give him the point because he gave me a point. <laughs> All right. All right. This is the last one for 80s metal here. Okay. What movie did Metallica use to put together their first music video for oh, the I song I don't one? Know the name of it. I know what you're talking about. I don't know the name of it. Jason Robards, but I don't know the name of it. If I had it written down. I actually had to look it back up. It's like Johnny Get Your Gun. Yes. I know Jason Robards was in it, but I didn't remember what it was called. Yes. I, I actually, I, I looked that one up and uh, I have never watched it, but what a creepy, I mean, I remember it when it came out way back when, but what a creepy thing, you know? And uh. I made Amber watch Kiss Meets the Phantom two weeks ago. <laughs> I have that on VHS. It's a I have never right? seen that, Jamie, and I'd yeah. like to see it. I, I'll send I you. I'll send, I'll send you a bootleg screening. Line, okay, <laughs> send it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My favorite line is "Gene's brothers and only child." Gene's brothers and only child, with the guy who did the Peter's voiceover because he was too wasted to show up for the, the yes. voiceover stuff. Yeah. Okay, trivia question: I, yeah. Who 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 did the voice for Peter Chris? He did I don't the know. voice. I do not know. It's the guy who did Aquaman on Super Friends. That doesn't surprise me one bit. He had to be in that that you know circle of people who did that. So the people who made that movie, I forgot they were they were the cartoon people. And then um, and then there's Ace, and they've got guns. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So the last section here is Christian metal. Yep. All right. Whatever that is exactly. Guardian. What's, it's like. It's like hamburger sandwich, Christian Mill. Yeah. <laughs> what secular band did members of Rage of Angels join? Jamie. Jamie. Hart. Here's one. What MTV video host played Striper's Soldiers Under Command and then said, put to the audience, okay, Striper fans, put your crayons away? Adam what? Curry. I don't know. No, it was sure. it wasn't it D Snyder. Touchdown. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Before in 1985, MTV had a show called Heavy Metal Mania. They did mm -hmm. it ran by yeah, two hours. Yeah. Not Headbangers Ball. Heavy Metal Mania mm -hmm. was on like once a month, yeah. maybe. And I was over. It was my a Thursday friend. night, right? I don't know. I yeah. saw it on a buddy of mine had recorded it on VHS. And he said, Hey yeah. man, why don't you come over? So we're in high school. It's 85. All of a sudden, Soldiers Under Command comes on. I'm like, 
Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then D Snyder says, okay, Striper fans, there you have it or something. You can put your crayons away. True story. About two or three months later or a year later, I'm with my friend, Dave Johnson. Uh-huh. Guy, we did white throne together yeah, and everything. Uh-huh. Dave Johnson said, yeah, um, I bought 777 postcards and in crayon wrote, would you please play Striper's oh, video? Wow. wow. And mailed wow. him in. Wow. And so so that's why he said that line. Yep. That's insane. I actually love, <laughs> love, love yeah. that. Yes. I mean, I was like, no way you did that. He's like, yeah, I did. I, <laughs> I remember I remember Dave Mustaine hosting Headbangers Ball when they released Shining Star and him saying like this is you know striper who are now anti-christian or something like that. he said something like something similar like that a little trivia tony palacios's wife brenda grew up and went to school with dave mustaine <laughs> so, yeah and tony went to school with michelle pfeiffer so let's kind of figure that one out hmm. so, yeah. okay i barely finished school so <laughs> there's here's one what and i i, I have to admit i did not write the drummer's name down here so bear with me okay on saints 1986 album times end the drummer <laughs> what band did the drummer play before he was he played on that saint record yeah got that one it was brian willis and he played with quarter flash yes Good sir yeah. dude i still have a sweet spot for times in oh yeah, yeah. i like that record man with the demon possessed french fries guys on the cover (laughs) the fry guys yes that's funny okay here's one what band did michael bloodgood record the track you lose before the debut bloodgood album i don't think i asked that question quite right but that i I don't know i'm not sure i'm not aware of any of michael bloodgood stuff before bloodgood to be honest what track he recorded? You lose with a different. What you what, lose. what what band <laughs> did Michael Bloodgood record the track "You Lose" for before the debut Bloodgood album? I don't know. Cyprus. That was the band Michael was in. It was his band. There was a demo, and Michael sang it. Really? Yes. Wow. And my open mouth and insert foot moment was when Dave and I, Dave Johnson and I, we interviewed Michael Bloodgood in 1986, uh, <laughs> SoCal, California. And of course, in my 18, 19 year old exuberance, yeah, man, I heard that song. Whoever sang this sounded like, it sounded like the monkeys. <laughs> yeah. Like Michael yeah. kind of goes, yeah, I, I, I sang that. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Dave looks at me, goes, oh, good one, Kevin. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. What locale, now here's a question, what locale, what place, location, did Baron Cross record their Hotter Than Hell live album? Jamie. Is that is that the water, did they do that in the Waters Club in LA? In Long no. Beach? Oh. I don't know. Okay. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can tell you, there's a hole in your heart you can't seem to feel. <laughs> It's, you try it's, everything. I, can, I can hear Michael Mike Lee going, it's good to be back home. Thank you very much. They recorded it at the International Ballroom. Ah. And oh, the thing was, was Soldier, not Holy Soldier, but Soldier from Northern California Jimmy, was yeah. asked, because I roadied for Rick Hunter. Uh-huh. But the thing was, the two times I didn't make it down to SoCal, one was for that show and one was for when they recorded the two songs because I had like finals or something for college the next, that Monday. There was no way I could make it down, do the school. I, yeah, it was, I, I really am bummed I didn't get to be there for that. Yeah, you know, around 99 or 2000, Guardian did a live record and it was mostly stuff from the Bottle Rocket and Buzz tour that was stuff. The crowd noise and the stage raps are from Latin America the record itself is recorded in Tony's basement. We did we did it live, but we used the we used the crowd raps and stuff from Latin America because we didn't get any, we never got a good like live recording. Do so what you, you gotta do. If, if you hear me talking to people like, did you see that? Blah, blah, blah. I'm looking at Tony's basement wall. You know? <laughs> yes. Okay. Here's here's one. Name the pure metal band 
who released the album Calling Down Fire. Yes. Rosanna's Raiders. Woohoo! From Australia. We are yes, Raiders. Sir. <laughs> All right. Uh, number seven. Which pure metal artist was signed after winning the 1989 band competition at Cornerstone? Jamie. Novella. No. No. No, actually, they did the same. No, okay, I get you. Wax on. Wax on. How, about, how about Exalt? Touchdown. Who was it? Oh, Exalt. Are you sure about that? Because it's like, I thought that was that Kevin guy, Pure Metal, like his little pet project he brought in. So Kevin Wessner. Um, I was at that festival in 89. Uh-huh. Paradox played. Yeah. I mean, Paradox. No, I, I played. <laughs> Exalt won. I played, you guys I, played. We saw Tempest in, I don't know if we saw Tempest. It was it had to have been 90, I guess. No, you would I was out, I was completely out by 90. Like like my the last Tempest show ever was in January of 1990. So then I, it was 89 that we saw you on the main stage. You in 89 no, Tempest never played the main stage. We played we played with Sacred Warrior in, in a side stage right before. Well, there because there were three stages. Uh-huh. Two indoor and then the big giant stage outdoor. We didn't play there, outdoor, the, yeah. but there was there was the bigger of the two indoor stages. Mm -hmm. That's where we saw Tempest we and played, with Sacred Warrior. Yeah, but Sacred Warrior they, and, Vin, and Vengeance had played there like the day before or something or after the same thing. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Yes. But where they had the uh Battle of the Bands uh -huh. was in the small metal building, which had the smallest stage. And Exalt won. I want I seriously still wonder if that whole thing was like a thing that like Kevin Wessner had brought them in. And yeah, they were, they were I don't even want to go know. there because yeah. I had my own experiences with pure metal and yeah. yeah. Oh, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Of Tempest and pure metal. No. All right. Last this is the last question I have. This is a softball. I need I it. <laughs> what was the song on White Cross's uh Love on the Line EP sung by Rex Carroll? Oh, uh, yes. Amy. Was it Simple Man? Mm -mm. All right. Cat. Oh. I, I don't know. I, that's, I never had Love It was some sort of blues song, right? Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm sitting here going, oh, gosh, I can't believe I just forgot the name of it. You need to ask me about, like, Knock Him Alive from Dual Edge or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I know that. The uh, the song title was called I. Oh gosh, where'd it go? What is it? I believe. I believe. Yeah. Oh, I still believe. I like it. This fine woman here I've been married to for since 2016. We were together in 2015. I remember looking at her phone and after the first like week we've been together and stuff like that and looking at her search, it says, who is Guardian? <laughs> and like, she had no idea about any of this stuff. And I kind of like that. She knew Striper and everything, but that's, that's about it. When he mentioned that he was in a band <laughs> and I said, oh, I said like a garage band. And he said, no. <laughs> I'm a garage fan. <laughs> well, maybe. That's all right. My wife is right, the same. The same. Right. She didn't, my wife didn't know what she was getting into. Yeah, you know? heck yeah. <laughs> See, it's funny that Vengeance box set or something you got back here it almost looks like that band Venom. The, the logo, I just realized it looks almost like Venom. Venom. <laughs> yeah. Take a shot at me if it makes you feel better. I believe in the truth now more than ever. Bitter little wanna be attention getter. I don't bow to your pressure.
I'm man enough to admit, I think Jamie got the better of me, guys. So. I don't think I did, man. You, you, you smoked, yeah, you smoked me on classic rock. I, early 70s, I don't know nothing about that. Uh, you got me on the 80s. I, you know, anyway, but my, my hat's off to you, Jamie, and uh, don't want to keep you and Miss Amber, you know, take care for your whole day. But uh, thank you all for being our guests. And uh, Rex, do we need to say, we need to mention anything else? And Kevin, thank you for co hosting with us and emceeing. And um, just, you know, Whenever it's available, if you want to buy a CD from Jamie, look in early December, correct, Jamie? Yeah. Let's, let's, if everything works out in a perfect world, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And but, um, you, will not, you will not be disappointed. Also, guys, it's, you know, just like I, like I said, the mission, you know, it's, it's, it's always the comfort zone is to always to tell people what they want to hear or something like that. And, and at the risk of like, just, I just cannot do that. I've got to be real and stuff like that. Even if it means, if it means kills never happens, if it means, but I got to be able to look in the mirror, but guys, I made a record and I addressed some things. I said things I, I felt needed to be said. And I don't have any other agenda other than just to, to make music mm -hmm. and be a follower of Christ. And that has nothing to do with music. That has to do with, you know, in the grocery store, be a follower of Christ. It's just, it's who I am, man. And I don't have to, you know, and like I said, if Guardian, I didn't start Guardian, but if Guardian would start in 2023, I would definitely not even try to function within quote unquote Christian music. I would not do it. But in 1993, that was the only place a band like Guardian could really function. So I don't, I don't hate it. But the thing is, the times have changed. The barrier to entry has been reduced. You just, and I, I really think in in history, if you do something great and honor God with it and stuff like that, that's the goal, man. Mm -hmm. You know, my opinion. I agree, Jamie. So, so well, friends, uh, we're going to sign off and and uh, thank you, Jamie, Miss Amber, for being our guest today, and thank you. thank you for watching, friends, and we'll see everybody on the flip side. So, Jamie, Miss Amber, stick around for one more moment, please. Sure, absolutely. Got it. I'm leaving. Yeah. Am no, I no. I don't refuse to speak now. This is going to be in the blooper thing. I can already tell. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Area 312 Rock and Metal Podcast. And I'm Rex, and I have two of my good friends with me. Kevin. I'm not one of Rex's good friends. So. <laughs> oh. Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> This is why we don't do this live, Jamie. <laughs> Scott. Who's I'm our good. guest co-host today? I'm good. Yeah, our guest co-host. That's you, Kevin. <laughs> oh, Kevin. And my co-host. <laughs> I can't. The co-host with the most. <laughs> with the most hair. With the most baldness. Oh, my. Oh, my. You got some editing to do, Ken, already. <laughs> um, <laughs>